welcome to St Ninian's in Stonehouse. I'm Stuart and it's my privilege to be the minister here and to share this time with you today. Wherever you are and whoever you are, you are welcome here. As always, I'd encourage you to like and share our service and to visit our website at saint-ninians-stonehouse.org.uk and to sign up for our email updates to find out all about what we do, where we are and how to get involved. We continue our journey through Matthew's story of Jesus today. It's a longer passage, which at first glance might seem very much like two separate stories that have nothing to do with each other. We'll find out soon that that's not the case. We read read from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 to 28. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees took offence when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged them, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Although the two parts of this passage we read might seem unrelated, there is a link. That's what the writer of Matthew's Gospel does. He places stories together to help us to see what's going on or to find meaning or to give us an example of what a bit of teaching looks like in action. So we start with what seems like a pretty basic idea. Jesus is talking about the purity laws. There's a long list of things that you're allowed to eat, how that food should be stored and prepared and rules about washing. In our time of hand washing and sanitising, we should, I hope, be able to see that this kind of advice around food preparation and personal hygiene, it's it's pretty important. In Jesus' day, there were no fridges, no laminated kitchen worktops, no temperature gauges and no bleach. If you got this stuff wrong, then people got sick. That's all well and good, but these instructions had been linked to religion. They had become just as much, perhaps more so, about keeping their religious rules as they were about good food hygiene practices. That might seem pretty odd for us. Why would you link those two things? Well, the answer goes back a long, long way. Back to the 40 years the people spent in the wilderness. The the people who left Egypt were slaves. They didn't have any rules or regulations of their own. They didn't have any government structures. For ages, Moses tried to run the whole thing on his own before he realised that it was far too much. The people were God's people. The rules that came were from God. And so Israel was a religious state. They didn't have a king, they had priests. Everything was religious, even washing your hands. So when we hear Jesus seemingly criticise the purity laws, like he does at the start of this passage, it's a big deal. But look at what he says. Who you are, whether you're good, whether you're holy, has nothing to do with what you eat and how you eat it. You eat food, your body processes it and the waste comes out the other end, just like everyone else. It's the stuff that comes out your mouth, the things that you say that matter. If you're full of hatred and anger and lust and violence, that has nothing to do with what you had for lunch. 
what you say reveals what kind of person you are, because words come from your heart. Look at the list of things Jesus talks about. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness and slander. These are what happens when you fail to keep the Ten Commandments. What does it matter if you don't eat shellfish, if you go out and murder someone and steal their stuff? He's making an argument that people should live the law, not just keep it. Jesus has been saying this stuff since the very start. The Sermon on the Mount in chapter 4 is a sermon about living out the commandments, not just paying lip service to them. And of course, the Pharisees, the purity police, they're, they're upset. They keep order and they do it enforcing adherence to these behaviours, these rituals. It's the way they keep control. You have to conform. You have to behave in these ways, the ways that they tell you, because really it's God that says that you should do this stuff. And we're just making sure that you don't get into trouble with God. And they don't like it when someone undermines their rules, especially when it makes perfect sense. This is the ultimate insider conversation. It's a group of Jewish men talking about Jewish law and custom, and that's important because next we jump to a completely opposite scene. The region of Tyre and Sidon is on the other side of the lake. It's about as opposite as you can get. There Jesus and his disciples are the foreigners, the outsiders, the strangers who stand out and who have no place there. At first, the person that they meet is a Canaanite woman, and she's shouting at them. Have you ever been in a place where you feel completely conspicuous? You stand out a mile. That everyone is looking at you because you don't belong, because you're not like them. Well, that's how the disciples felt in this story. They're the ones who are the outsiders. Jesus has taken them across the lake to Tyre and Sidon. It's not part of Israel. They are the ones who will be looked on with suspicion, whose customs and behaviours are strange, whose accents stand out. They don't want to be there. This whole scene is a strange and difficult one. There's so much about it that we don't know, loads that we can imply or infer, and even more that, well, we just don't know. The woman is described as a Canaanite. Canaan doesn't exist anymore. So it's strange that Matthew calls her that. But it doesn't exist because the Israelites had taken over the land and killed most of them. That brutality had continued for years. Even King David was still killing Canaanites. Maybe that's why she calls Jesus son of David. Your people killed my people, and yet here we are, with me asking you for mercy, something your ancestors didn't show any of to mine. But I know who you are. And if you're the one that can save my daughter, then so be it. I'll kneel at your feet and I'll beg. Something else to consider is that in the region of Tyre and Sidon, the small Jewish communities that live there are poor and marginalised. Despite their history, the woman is the one with standing and status and power. She's not like the Samaritan woman that Jesus meets at the well. This woman is the one with the power here. But that social standing and wealth don't count for much in the face of sickness. So here they are, and you can feel the tension. Jesus doesn't say anything, but the disciples are pretty forthright. Send her away. She keeps shouting at us. She's drawing attention to us. Tell her to get lost. What follows is one of the most difficult pieces of scripture because in one reading, Jesus is awful to her. He calls her a dog and tells her there's nothing here for the likes of her. But she's persistent. Even dogs get crumbs from the table. And Jesus changes his mind and commends her faith. But that can't be it, surely. It can't just be that Jesus hits out with some casual racism and is shamed into changing his mind, can it? So here's another way to read it. This is a reversal of positions. Jesus and the woman switch roles to teach the disciples a lesson. Jesus says what his disciples would say. He's just been talking about how the stuff that comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart. By giving voice to their prejudice, tell her to leave. What does she want? Get her to shut up. He helps them to realise the impact they have on other people. Jesus, the one who keeps the law, who eats the right thing, who washes the right way, at the right time gives voice to their unclean thoughts. The woman in turn blows open their understanding by voicing what Jesus would say. Someone they consider unclean and impure because of what she eats and her religious practice, her race, is the one who speaks truth, who displays faith, who understands exactly who Jesus is, much better than they do. This is an acting out of the teaching that Jesus has just given them. 
There's even a nod back to the previous chapter, the feeding of the 5,000, with all this talk of leftovers, crumbs from the table. Remember after Jesus had fed all the people, there were 12 baskets left over, enough for everyone, even people like her. For the writer of Matthew's Gospel, the fact that Israel was a religious country where the religious law is the law of the land, where the priests keep order and where God is in charge is hugely important. That's because for him, Jesus will perfect that law. He'll show the people of Israel how to live it out so that they can be an example to the rest of the world. After all, if this whole following God thing doesn't work out for God's chosen people, then why would anyone else be interested? Israel's supposed to be a blessing to the rest of the world. If this isn't a lesson for us in our time, then I don't know what is. We still need to learn that those we think of as different are somehow worth less than us. They're also created in God's image. We still need to learn that those who practice religion in a different way from us have much to teach us about justice and mercy and about God's love. Mercy doesn't need to be pristine, nor does it need to be huge. It doesn't need to be protected, nor does it need to be kept in a pot with a lid and a lock and also carefully parceled out to those deemed as deserving. Just a crumb. Just a crumb will do. Mercy, it's not like a pie. Nor is it mealy-mouthed or stingy. It, it, it can't be measured. It can't help itself. It can't be contained. No matter how some try, still it overspills the tables of power and privilege, subversively escaping in scraps and crumbs that are limitless, boundary-breaking, that render tables irrelevant. Just a crumb will do. Mercy is subversive. It spills out for all, even those deemed by some as undeserving, different, not one of us. It redraws the circle wider than the edges of our imagination. Just a crumb. Just a crumb contains more than enough more grace and love than we will ever need. Just a crumb is enough.